come here today to speak about Lent and this beautiful time that we have of conversion. But before we do, I'd just like to place ourselves in the presence of our Blessed Mother. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I thought I'd just like to begin this Lenten talk um, just in the words that we heard when we received ashes this year, repent and believe in the gospel. So there we have, uh, in a very short, condensed way, all that we're asked to do during this Lenten period, to turn away from sin and to embrace God and His holy will for us. And so we would think that we normally do this, uh, and I'm sure that we do throughout the year, but the Holy Spirit is very active during Lent, and He will awaken in us maybe new rooms, new situations that I haven't uh, been aware of, or a deepening in my own conversion of heart. And so St. Ignatius of Loyola says that we are simply to separate ourselves from everything that is not God and we are in to embrace everything that is Him and His holy will for us. So what's so easy, at least for us to understand, why is it so hard to do? And so St. Paul gives us a glimpse of this in his words that in his own experience, you know, St. Paul having to battle of his own weaknesses, we see that all over Scripture, saying that when I am weak, then I am strong, and then also in another moment praying that some thorn that he had in his side that he was struggling to get rid of and didn't seem to make headway and it seemed to accompany him throughout his life and prayed to our Lord and the Lord answered him, my grace is sufficient for you. So, and, on, and besides that, uh, he says these words very strong, I don't do the good that I want. I really want to do good, but I don't do the good that I want. I do the bad that I don't want. And so we have this contradiction within us, this tendency to sin. So our church calls this concupiscence, strange word. And uh, so we have different forms of concupiscence. And before we touch that, just, well, maybe a good image for this is like uh, coals. So we have these burning coals within us. And as long as we don't put anything on them, and as long as they just remain warm, uh, we're, we're pretty much okay. But when we put any form of twig or branches or leaves on top of that, uh, they get hotter, and so we sin more. And so there's this whole, this dynamic going within us that we have to, we have to know ourselves. We have to know that we have this within us, and that's why within our church, you know, Pope Francis says that it's a field hospital. The church is a field hospital and that I, and, and I'm sick. And so therefore, w when we talk about the sickness, this is what we're talking about. And if we have any doubt regarding original sin and the effects of it, we just have to just read the newspaper every day. And unfortunately, every single day, something new will jump at us regarding, my gosh, how is that possible? Well, it's because what St. Augustine says, that, you know, without the grace of God, each of us, each of us are, are capable of doing anything. And so that's why Lent is a time to go deep. With Lent, we have to take off all masks in our lives, uh, types of um, appearances that we have. Uh, normally, human tendency is to try to please others, so we have certain masks that we use in certain scenarios. We have our, our church mask. That's that one where we're just, I'm okay, you're okay, and, you know, we greet each other, go about our business, and, you know, we even have our, our Facebook mask, you know, the one where everything's perfect. We have perfect lives, you know, my, my, my image is photoshopped, and even my food is perfect, you know. So, anyways, this is our, our human tendency, and then, with the, and then you go home, and then, you know, rocks are thrown, and sticks, and things, and, and bruises, and broken bones, you know. So, uh, I mean, even Mother Teresa says, ch charity is the hardest at home. So we're all sinners, collect, so we have personal sin that we have to call out by its name, and then, we, and then we have collective sin. And so there's no secret sins. 
There's nothing that's not going to damage the church. There's nothing that's not going to damage me because many times sin is done without anyone being there. And sin can even be in the intention that no one will ever see. So the point of the matter is, is that God knows. And so there's a certain nakedness, so to speak, that we're supposed to have during Lent in our relationship with God to completely present ourselves as we are because He already knows. And so that being said, the, during Lent, we have not just during Lent, but during the whole year, this beautiful sacrament of confession. And so the, a few ideas that I'd just like to present regarding you know, how to make a better confession, because I think we had, we've heard enough regarding, okay, the need to go to confession and that, and even doing an you know, uh, examination of conscience, a detailed examination of conscience, which is very good to do, and we should take enough time to do that. But understanding that certain sacraments depend on disposition that we have. And so this disposition means, even like in the imitation of Christ, saying that one communion received with the right disposition is capable of making us a saint. So it's very interesting, that dynamic. So what are some of these dispositions that help us take better advantage of this beautiful sacrament of confession? So when we leave confession, we really experience a difference. Because how many of us approach the sacraments in a routine manner. This is one of the dangers of our faith. We, we, we live, we, because we've done things so many times, we get into this routine manner of living. And so if we're sincerely seeking conversion of heart, the first step of confession, as we just mentioned, the examination of conscience. And so as time goes on, I come to discuss, with, by examining my own conscience, at least before confession, but hopefully as a religious practice that we do frequently, hopefully one a day, at least for a few minutes. You know, what was the grace of God doing in my life today? And then, unfortunately, maybe how did I fall? And what were the circumstances there? And, and so that's where we come to know ourselves. And so normally we end up confessing basically the same thing. And so what we're talking about here is not that we don't have, bring the same matter to confession, but there is a sincere resolve never to sin again. And so what happens is, going back to the words repent and believe in the gospel, is that there has to be sincere repentance. So what scripture says in the gospel is that no man can serve two masters, and that there will always be a Lord over our life, and, and that we freely choose whom we serve. But when there's not this sincere break, when there's some type of clinging to something that's not from God in our lives, this hinders us, and it's normally something very subtle and very secret. And so we have to open all these doors to Christ. We have to, we have to open up these doors so that the light of Christ enters. So there's a story, and uh, basically it's about a, about a boy and, uh, in his home, and his, his mother you know, asked him to clean his room. And so you know, the boy was there playing his, uh, with his video console, you know, not the old Atari from us that are a certain age, but the Xbox, the latest edition. And so what happened is, is that, uh, that the boy says, get out of here. Unfortunately, you know, has, un, you know, sometimes children disrespect their parents. And so that's what happened. But the mother very kindly just kind of went in there to show him, to teach him that, no, actually your room is not, uh, not in order. And, but it was dark. It was dark and dingy in the room. And so she goes to the blinds. She opens up the blinds, light enters the room, and all of a sudden everything starts to appear. There you have your cobwebs in the corner, and you have, you know, the cockroaches on the ground, and all these things. So, banal example, however, what that means is the Holy Spirit needs to enter into the darkness. And once that happens, all of a sudden I start to detect things. When the Holy Spirit enters, all of a sudden things that I, had ne I wasn't aware of of this dirt and this grime, it comes out and it bothers me. When that's something that's good, is that that means that I'm actually converting. Because if I have the tendency to say, you know, I haven't really done any heinous crimes or I've, you know, I haven't severely broken the commandment, I mean, this is not what we're talking about. We're talking about a sincere desire to be holy. What we're talking about is this delicacy of conscience. 
Another example of this would be if that were in our vehicle and you know we have the habit of, at least myself, I, I like to have the habit of removing any, any art, article of garbage in there that you know, so it doesn't stay there. And because it's been my experience that once you leave one thing, then all of a sudden, you know, there's two or three more, you know, articles left after that. And before you know it, you, you're not even aware. You're not even aware that your, your whole vehicle is cluttered. And so something similar happens in our conscience. So, so we have to know ourselves, we have to accept ourselves, and then we have to overcome ourselves. So when we talk about this acceptance of self, what we're not talking about is making a pact with any sin. This is something very important for us. We can never make a pact with a sin. But what we mean is we have, we have deeply uh, rooted disordered tendencies that somehow are part of who we are. And so we have, to, we have to live our spiritual life in a serene manner knowing that I will never be free of imperfections or these, or these disordered tendencies, etc. And so the sorrow for sin that we bring into the confession, as we know, we have, you know, we have imperfect contrition, we have perfect contrition. And so the imperfect contrition, as the catechism says, is always enough for us to receive the sacrament of confession, but that would be fear of the consequences of my sin, fear of eternal punishment. That's imperfect uh, contrition. Then we have our perfect contrition, which is I, I'm deeply sorry because I've offended my God who loves me so much, this personal loving relationship. I've hurt my friend. And also scripture says, you know, these words, and these are helpful for us, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. And so when we say collectively, we have sinned, well, during Lent, and even, well, especially during our whole life, is that I have to say I, is that I have put him there. Each one of us, because of our sins, is precise, that's, that what, that's what has happened. Because of my sins, I have put Christ on the cross. And so this deep sorrow for having hurt my friend, uh, you know, this is what perfect contrition is about. And so the repentance and the renouncement mean that, you know, sometimes without us realizing it, that, you know, certain pacts have to be undone. We've made agreements and that those agreements need to be undone. And so in our, in the, in our diocese, we have this beautiful ministry, the unbound ministry. And it's important to say a few words about this because if we want to know whether this might be a good, uh, you know, experience for me, it, confession has a lot to do with this, whether I might need a little bit more prayer. Because, you know, if I leave, con if I leave confession and I'm still sad and something is still over me and I don't know what that is, well, I, I might need help discovering, you know, how to undo that. And so the steps of confession are very similar as well to what happens in the dynamic of the unbound ministry. So thanks be to God that we have this beautiful opportunity to receive this, to go deeper, to receive greater freedom. Sometimes we're not, we, we need coaching in this. We're not capable of doing this ourselves. And so I don't think there's any one of us who wouldn't say, I wouldn't like to be more happy or I wouldn't like to experience greater freedom. And so what are some of these hindrances that we have regarding not being more free and, and being bound, so to speak. Well, forgiveness is huge. Forgiveness is something that, this is what we're talking about, the disposition to receive uh, the, the merciful you know, love of God, is that in Scripture says that we must forgive others as our Heavenly Father has forgiven us. And so, unforgiveness, we, we justify ourselves for not forgiving. And we might be, you know, there might be reasons for this. And no one's saying that they're not. No one's saying that I have not been unjustly treated. No one's saying that, you know, I, I, it's, it's real what happened to me. But the thing about forgiveness is that, is that when we don't forgive from the heart, we have some type of stain on our heart that prevents God's mercy from penetrating it. And so it's a decision that we make. If we there's there, either we feel like we're not capable of doing it or we don't want to do it. And so that's where we ask the Holy Spirit to enter. And so this lack of forgiveness, it's not just with someone who I know I have present relationships with. This could be someone 
uh, this could be a family member that is not even living anymore. This can be someone who in my past does not even live in my city anymore. And so the, what happens is, is that that person goes along about their life and, and, and totally happy, enjoying life. But myself, I carry this, this heavy weight with me and many people to, to the end of life. And so, you know, we ask the Holy Spirit to give us the strength. Actually, what we're doing is allowing Jesus to forgive the other person in us. So he just wants to free us from the burden. And so um, the proposal of amendment is another area of confession that we, we need to understand with the adult, the example, the adulterous woman in the gospel, that Jesus shows her tremendous mercy forgives her all of her sins, but then at the end says, go and sin no more. And so we need to have a plan in place. We need to understand that at, there's always a, there's a pattern for my sins. There's always a beginning. And so this beginning is called the near occasion of sin. And so the near occasion of sin could be, it's, could be a person, could be a place, could be a thing, and it's different for each one of us. What's a near occasion of sin for me is different what the near occasion of sin for you. You know, the, maybe the near occasion of sin for you is to, I don't know, uh, an ice cream cone. That's different than mine or whatever. A glass of wine, whatever it may be. So anyways, that's um, this is something very important. This is part of the knowledge of self. And so what happens is, is that uh, the evil one has a, he has, he has a card on us. So he, he knows what has made us fall in the past and he'll bring it out again. And so for us to leave confession and not having a plan in place, well, it, it should, we're just going to fall again. And so this is something very important. Uh, and then we have our life of penance. And even in, if we look at, you know, this COVID period that we're living in and how much frustration that we felt and how, and how many times we've been angry and, and all of this, well, if I'm a sinner, then somehow I have to accept this to make satisfaction for my sins. Because uh, what ha what, so sin, what, it's, what confession does, and this is just an image from, from like the Baltimore Catechism. We can see these different photos and images of these older Catholic books. And there's one that I, I, I remember greatly, and it's just showing Jesus on the cross, saying what confession is, and confession taking out the nail. So the nails were moved. But what happens is, is there's still a hole there that needs to be filled. It needs to be healed. And so that, that's my life of penance where I have to make up for past sins. I have to make up for wrongdoing. And so let us embrace suffering, my brothers and sisters, and also with this light. Another f way to explain this is the prayer that said by the priest in an older form of, of, conf of absolution that, you know, that my... My life, my, my works, and all I do, I offer in satisfaction for my sins. And so we like to just uh, continue then this Lenten journey. We listen to those words uh, on Ash Wednesday from the second reading, especially beautiful about uh, now is the acceptable time. Today is the salvation. So what are we waiting for?